السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض اللهم عنا معهم أجمعين اللهم أمين رب شرح لي صدري وعسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Inspired the theme of the daily reminder conference and I believe that all the organizers, mashallah, volunteers, Sheikh Mu'izz Bukhari, uh, even the speakers, they have come to this conference for only this reason, is to inspire you. So that when you leave, inshallah, today, you leave a different person, as a different person, who will create some positive changes in their lives. So those who have been doing something wrong, they will improve, inshallah, and those who are already good, they will become better. That's the main intention of all the speakers and the organizers and the volunteers. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our task easy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this conference as a reminder even for all the speakers and all the learned uh, brothers and sisters here. Now when I was preparing for the, for the talk, I was confused. You know, on, on, on the lineup of the speakers includes Dr. Bilal Phillips. Dr. Bilal Phillips started the da'wah when I was two years old. <laughs> yeah. And when I started coming to Islam, he was my teacher. Like I used to, saw all, I used to see all his videos on YouTube, uh, he and Sheikh Husseini, and now I'm invited in a conference to speak next to them, so it makes my task very difficult. And then the people call me Sheikh. I want to I wanna just define the word sheikh first. The, the word sheikh, linguistically speaking, uh, means an old man. <laughs> now, as you know, I'm not old. Yeah? And also, it, it has this scholarly, uh, you know, uh, meaning. Like, sheikh, learned, scholar. Which also I'm not. So, please, guys, just call me brother. <laughs> Don't make a mistake. That's why yesterday in the panel discussion, if you have attended, I told him, I'm not going to open my mouth. I'm just going to ask the questions. SubhanAllah. So may Allah subhanahu wa That's why I chose a very light topic. Why? To inspire you and to remind myself. And when they told me stories of change, I was also thinking, what kind of story am I going to tell? So I discussed with Sheikh Sajid Omar, and he gave me the green light. Tell your story. How did you leave your music singing and how your Catholic wife became a Muslim. So, inshallah, I'm going to start with this story. But before that, I wanted to tell you that making a change, making a positive change into your life is something really difficult. Especially the beginning. The first step towards that change is difficult. It's not easy. But once a change has been made, adjustments becomes easier. I wanted to repeat that again. Making a change into your life is difficult. We have to accept that. We have to agree on this. It's difficult to make a change. To shift from one home to another is difficult, is hectic, is a hassle. But once you move to a new house, adjustments to that new environment becomes easier, right? So, I, want you to, I wanted you also to remember something very important that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will not send to you angels to change you. He's not going to do that. He's not going to come down to tell you, hey, wake up, change before it is too late. Yes, he's going to send you signs after signs, but he subhanahu wa ta'ala will never come down to ask you to change or will send you angels to make you change. You have to take the first step. And that's why. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never ever change the condition of any human being, of any group of people, unless and until they change what is within themselves. Take a step forward towards that change and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. To bring about this positive change into your life. But that is even easy. When you start making a change, it's easy. 
But to maintain, to remain upon the straight path is a challenge. So making a change is easy. But to remain upon the straight path until the end is difficult. And that's why the scholars would say, العبرة ليست بمن سبق العبرة بمن ثبت The challenge is not about becoming religious more than others. No. The challenge is to remain upon the straight path until the end. That's the challenge. They say also طريق الله طويل They say the journey, the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too long. But the challenge is not about walking on that path. No. The challenge is to die upon that path, to remain steadfast until the end. So I'm going to nar narrate to you this story, but I don't want anybody to be fascinated about the person. I wanted you to take lessons from this story. So here we go. Once upon a time, in a far, far away land, <laughs> that was in Egypt. As the brother was introducing, when I was young, I started to develop that love for music. I used to sing, I used to compose music, and I used to dance. Yes, I used to dance. <laughs> I'm a little bit fat now, but yeah. But anyway, <laughs> that was my passion. I used to tell my father, music is in my blood. And my mother used to tell me, Wallahi, this is what she used to tell me every morning. Do you know when we were at that certain age when we cannot accept this annoying advice from our parents? Do you know that? Like every morning she used to wake me up and tell me what? You will never benefit anyone from your music and you will never be benefited. Every morning I dream to become a star and she always, you know, demotivate me. But she was right. I composed music. I sing. I worked, I earned a lot of money because of, from this field. But what benefit do I get? And what did I benefit others with? My music. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. She was truthful to what she said. I did not pray for many years. In fact, because of that field, you know, they required you to be awake all night and sleeping all day. So I would go home around 5 a.m. I would be hearing the Adhan, the Fajr Adhan, but I will hide behind a trash bin next to my building. Why? Because there is a sheikh coming down going to Fajr and I'm afraid he would see me and tell me, come and pray with me. That was me. Uh, some accident happened, took place in my family. I don't want to go into that detail, but I left Egypt. I came to know a girl who was living in Hong Kong City and she came down to Egypt. We got to know each other. We fall in love and all that stuff. <laughs> and then we moved to Hong Kong. We moved to Hong Kong. Now in Hong Kong, she started to teach me business and I hated it. And I told her, listen, I wanted to become the star, the next star in this town. So she helped me and then I started to form a band and we started hitting the market, singing, making a lot of money for one year in Hong Kong. But I was not happy yet. Still nobody running after me, asking me for autograph. No, no, no. Still I can ride the bus and the train. No, no, no. I want, I want something bigger. That was my ambition. So I asked some friends in the field. I told them, who is the most popular singer in town? Just give me a name. I'm going to compete with that man. They told me a man by the name of Leslie Chung. Anyone knows him? Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi. All of you? All of you? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, don't go and search his name anymore. So I say, okay, Leslie Chang was called the Asian biggest superstar. I say, that's the one I wanted to compete with. So I worked so hard on the hope of competing with him and becoming a star like him. Or even, you know, become bigger than him in the field. I, I tried to reach his production company. And one day, Shaitan came to me and told me, hey, Wael. I say, yes, Shaitan. What do you want? <laughs> he said, listen, why don't you make Leslie Chang sing Arabic with Chinese melody and you sing Chinese with Arabic melody? It's an evil genius idea back then. So I tried to reach his production company and some people around in the field, they loved the idea and so on and so forth. I was about to get there and one day I was in China. Now, those who are confused about China and Hong Kong, uh, China and Hong Kong are, are one country, but two systems, all right? So I have to cross the border and something like that. 
don't worry about the confusion. But I was in China that day, I'm watching the news, and all of a sudden, I saw the photo of my hero, my idol, Leslie Chung, in the news of 7.30, which is something strange. And they announced the news that Leslie Chung had committed suicide. He threw himself off one of the hotels in Central. And I was left there for an hour or more at shock. Why would you do that? I wanted to be like him. I wanted to have money like him. I wanted to be famous like him. That's what I wanted to be. So why such a person would end up his life like this? I was at shock. Even my wife was hitting me. And she told me later that she was hitting me. And I, I didn't feel anything. I was left depressed for two months. I would sleep. I would try to sleep. And all of a sudden, I would jump off the bed without knowing the reason. And my heartbeat would be too fast to an extent that my wife also, every time I would get up, like, you know, scared, she would also jump off the bed with me. So I decided to leave the bed, to leave that room, because my wife, poor girl next to me, she can't sleep. I was lost. I was lost. I was thinking, why, why, why? And then a thought occupied my entire life during this period. You are going to die like Leslie Chung. This thought came into my mind like every moment in my life during that period, during these two months. I forgot to mention something very important that my wife was a Catholic, a devoted Christian Catholic. And she used to go to church every single Sunday. She was very devoted to her religion. And of course, because I love the missus, every time she would invite me to go to church, I would say, yes, honey, sure. Because I had no principles back then. I have no values back then. I didn't care whether she's a Christian, Catholic. I didn't care. I'm just interested in the girl. That's it. So she would invite me to go to church. I would go with her. I would even, you know, participate in the rituals. And the priest will, will, will give this biscuit, round biscuit, to his worshippers. And he would say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Now, you have two choices. Either you open your mouth and take the biscuit directly from the priest's hand. Or you take it on your hand and eat it. Now, deep in my heart, I, real, I, I knew that this is not my religion. I knew it. But I was not practicing. I, I started remembering my father, may Allah have mercy on him. He used to, you know, run after us in the street, holding me from my shirt like this. And he would throw me literally in the masjid, and he would tell the sheikhs and the brothers over there, teach him how to pray. I remember those days. Memories start gushing into my mind. But I still go, to, go with my church, uh, go, go with my wife. And the lesson to learn here, why did I go with my wife to the church? Because I love her, right? And if you love someone, you would do your best to please that person. So if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my brothers and sisters, if you love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will do what it takes to create a positive change into your life. So, because I love the missus, I have to go with her to the church. So the priest will tell me, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Mm. I would take, it was no way I'm going to open my mouth. You know? <laughs> so I took the biscuit, but I feel it's haram. So I would say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <laughs> to make it halal, yani. Give it the halal stamp. <laughs> because... By fitrah, this is, you know, the innate, you know, religion in my heart is Islam. I, I grew up in a house where my mom is to be found in two locations, the kitchen or the prayer rug. If anyone wanted to find my mom, these are her places. Either the kitchen cooking, amazing stuff. <laughs> or the prayer rug, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So seeing these memories makes me feel that going to the church is something really wrong. So one day even my wife told me, let's go out. I say, why? She said, let's go out because they're giving wine in the church. I say, but the imam of the church is giving wine. Why are you objecting? <laughs> so she said, no, I don't believe that wine should be served in the house of worship. I say, no, 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 no. I, there must be something wrong. I wanted to pray. That's what come to my mind. I just wanted to pray. I am missing those days of prostrating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we were little. 
Music, the world of music, fame, money have taken me away from spirituality. I gain a lot of money because of music, yet I'm still depressed. I'm still unhappy. And here is an example. A man who was very popular, 50,000 or more people will attend his concert. People will fly from all over Asia just to attend his concert and take photos and take autographs from him. Here he is. He committed suicide, leaving a suicidal note in his hotel room saying what? Depression. Why all these channels have offered, did not offer anything to Leslie other than depression? Why? And why am I feeling the same thing now? So I said I wanted to pray. So one night I woke up and I went to a very dark room in our house, which I remember we never use it. It was just there. And I said I wanted to pray. So without wudu, without knowing where is the qibla, I just say Allahu Akbar. I still remember Al-Fatiha, alhamdulillah. I still remember those short surahs, yeah. So I start saying Allahu Akbar. And as, as we all know, as soon as you say Allahu Akbar in the salah, you start remembering all history that you have, you know, done in your life. You remember situations that you never recall for years. During the salah, you remember all this. Like, did I left the oven on? Did I left the key? Where did I put the key? Did, did I change the diaper to myself? All these things would come into your mind. So I was no different. But I remembered something better. I remembered those days where I was in the masjid, when I was very little. And I remember this sheikh telling me, son, if you wanted to focus in your salah, do the following. Imagine the Kaaba right in front of you. Jannah is on your right hand. Hellfire al ayadu billah is on your left. And who's waiting at the back? The angel of death. Just waiting for you to finish your salah so that he can take out your soul. So imagine if that would be your last salah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given you a chance to pray and this would be your last salah, after that you would see the angel of death. How will this salah be? Will it be like chicken picking from the floor? Quickly, quickly. Alhamdulillah. Hello. Assalamualaikum. What are you doing, man? <laughs> so, I, 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 I said, okay, let's, let's do it right. So I say, Allahu Akbar. And I started reciting Al-Fatiha. Nothing happened. No miraculous signs came into my room. The room was very dark still. No birds came in from the window, <laughs> nothing, nothing. But I felt something different happening in my heart. And when I reached to the end, I start saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My wife was there. I thought the angel of death is already here. Oh. <laughs> inna lillahi wa inna la raji'oon. But alhamdulillah, it turned out to, uh, she's a different kind of angel, alhamdulillah. Honey, don't mind about what I said. <laughs> She was there. And then she started to ask me, what are you doing? Why are you kissing the floor? You're leaving me in the room for two months. And now you're kissing the floor. I say, no, 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 I'm praying. And then I started, you know, she started to ask me questions about the prayer. Why are you doing this? What, what is this all about? My wife had, hadn't seen any Muslim at prayer because I myself was always at the wrong place. I was always in the wrong place. She, so she didn't have a chance to be exposed to the Muslims. Subhanallah. And as Brother Amjad Majid was mentioning earlier about the concept of I don't know. You remember like you shouldn't open your mouth about anything, especially the religion, without certain knowledge. Just say I don't know. Or try to find the answer later and then come back and provide the necessary answer. But I want to tell you a secret. But don't tell anyone, okay? I want to tell you a secret. Generally speaking, with, without any disrespect to the Arabs uh, at all, because I'm an Arab myself, but this is a reality. Mostly, the Arabs don't know how to say, I don't know. You get it? The Arabs mostly, generally, yani, yani speaking, generally, not all, they do not know how to say, I don't know. They must talk. If you come to Egypt, my country, and if you ask someone, uh, where is that school? He would say, just go straight. So you keep going straight, going straight, going straight, and then you reach to a place. There's no schools here. So you ask somebody else, where is that school, please? He say, go straight. <laughs> so you keep going back and forth, and you will never reach your destination. Why don't you just say, I don't know? I was no better. 
So my, my wife kept on asking me about Islam and I had no idea what I was saying because I must talk. So I remember one question though. She asked me, if I become a Muslim, what would be the difference between my religion and your religion? I say, if you do not become a Muslim, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> That's what I know. You have to become a Muslim. So I was, I was uh, you know, away from this world of learning and so on and so forth. But today my wife came to me and she told me, listen, I want to pray. I wanted to pray, but I don't want to become a Muslim. I said, what do you mean? She said, I wanted to experience the Muslim's prayer, but I don't want it to become a Muslim. I said, okay. So I printed out this formal prayer. I gave her a copy and we started to pray. Allahu Akbar. I started to recite. She's reading the translation. Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. She's reading the translation. And here is the moment that she was looking for. She was actually planning to do the prostration a long time ago, but she was you know, afraid, reluctant. But when she hit the ground, I heard her. While I'm saying subhanahu rabbi al-a'la, I heard something coming from, you know, my wife's side like this. <laughs> she was crying. I was wondering. I even left the salah. I didn't know what I was saying. But I was trying to look at her. You know why not? <laughs> are you okay? And I want to say, are you okay? <laughs> Do you need any help? Why are you crying? Subhanallah. And when she arrived, when we finish the salah, I don't know what's wrong. She say, God is worthy of being worshipped and praised like this. This is how we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, from this moment onward, every day was a slap on my face from my wife. Every day. That was a slap on my face. Because here is a Catholic girl who lived all her life worshipping Jesus, worshipping the saints. She's from the Philippines. And now she's admiring the salah, which I have been raised upon. But I took things for granted because people, they normally say, you're a Muslim, don't worry, you're going to Jannah anyway. No, Jannah is not that cheap, my brothers and sisters. Jannah is not that cheap. So her tears makes me wonder, why am I not crying like her? What is wrong with my heart? What is wrong with my heart? My wife started to ask about Jesus in Islam. And so I started to bring books and so on and so forth. By the way, this salah that I performed earlier in the night, that was it for me. I didn't start to pray regularly still. I still smoke. I still do all these bad things still. But my wife gradually was changing. And that was the slaps on my face every day. And one day we were listening to this lecture and my wife came to me and she told me I wanted to take shahada. I say, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> there are too much changes here happening. And then if you become a Muslim, now you're going to tell me this is haram, this is haram. <laughs> I was worried about my life, you know. <laughs> but I was happy. I was happy, but I was confused at the, at the same time. I didn't know how to handle such a situation. But my wife insisted she must take shahada, and she took the shahada right in front of me. Subhanallah. Not only that, but after a while, she started calling her mother to Islam. She started calling her brother to Islam and as a result her father, her brother, an entire area in the neighborhood became Muslims. And I was still thinking, when will I change? Two things happened that makes me decide that is it. The first thing, I wanted to buy a cigarette and I walked five bus stop away from, home, from my home to find a cigarette. It was late at night. And I realized that I was a slave to this cigarette. As opposed to being slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I decided no more smoking. The second was Shaykh Ahmad Didat rahmatullahi alayhi. May Allah have mercy on his soul. When he was debating someone. And he started the debate by reciting ayat from the Quran. Precisely. فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِيهُمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Subhanallah. When Shaykh Ahmad Didat started reciting the ayat. And I knew about his background that he's not an Arab. He's from India, background, raised in South Africa, debating someone in America. Every word, every ayah was coming into my heart like an arrow. Wake up, man. Wake up. There are other people doing better job than you. That was it. I say, no, no, I wanted to make a correction. But I realized that I cannot change by myself. And that's the lesson now that I wanted to convey. If you feel that you have something in your heart you want it to really change 
Find someone whom you trust and ask him. Ask him for, your help, for his help or for her help. This is what I did with my wife. I told her, listen, I wanted to change, but I don't know how. And she encouraged me. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said what? Al-mar'u ala deeni khalilih. A person will be always inclined to follow the religion of his best friend or the closest person to him. When I was in the wrong place, I used to follow those people. And now my wife is a Muslim. She wanted to pray. She's happy. She's putting on the hijab. I started to follow myself. Alhamdulillah. Who could ever imagine that my, myself would be standing giving a lecture about Islam? No one in my entire family members believed it. No one in my entire family, you know, friend circle uh, believed it. The first day I went to the masjid in Hong Kong, I was so happy, so excited. This is the first experience and the worst. The worst. I went to the masjid very happy. I wanted some f new friends, so I'm looking. Some icon brother. <laughs> you know, I just became Muslim. Uh, you know, just try to practice Islam, help me out and all that. And I was so loud. I didn't know anything about the ethics of the masjid. I was shouting, making fun, making jokes. And all of a sudden, a sheikh, an imam or someone, elderly man, came from the far distance of the masjid. And I felt the wind. He was running towards me. Haram! <laughs> So I told him, sorry, Sheikh, I, I, I didn't know. He said, don't laugh in the masjid. I said, okay. And when you laugh, he said, don't show your teeth. So I went back home <laughs> looking at the mirror trying to practice. How in the world am I going to laugh without showing my teeth? <laughs> I'm telling you this. Why? why am I telling you this? Because we need to understand that some people, when they are about to change, they need some support. Rather than raising the haram gun in their face. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when he sent two of his companions to Yemen to invite people to Islam, he told them what? He told them, Yassira, wa la tu'assira, wa bashira, wa la tunaffira, wa tatawa'a, wa la takhtalifa. He told them, make things easy for the people and do not make things difficult for the people. And he told them, Invite people to that which is good before telling them what is bad. Meaning, give them good news before giving them the bad news. Talk to them about Jannah before talking to them about hellfire. Talk to them about what is halal before talking to them about what's haram. You know, alhamdulillah, after I changed, I made that U-turn and I came back to Allah. We started this organizations and we started inviting people to Islam. Alhamdulillah, we have witnessed hundreds of people coming to Islam. And there is this... Uh, thing that I always experience, especially when a sister become a Muslim. So here it is. A sister will come forward telling me, I wanted to become a Muslim. I say, okay, sister, repeat after me. Ashhadu, ashhadu. Bit by bit. Now, while I'm giving the shahada to the sister, there is another sister at the back. She's ready with a hijab in her hand. <laughs> She's ready with a hijab in her hand. As soon as the sister say, Muhammad Rasulullah, she will jump and she put the hijab. Mabruk sister, congratulations. And thousands of kisses. Yeah. <laughs> we need to be, we need to be soft hearted on those people. And of course the brother who embraced Islam and a man came to him and told him, I know a very good doctor for the circumcision, don't worry. <laughs> he just came into Islam now and you're talking to him about something. Why? What? What? <laughs> Be easy on those people. In the beginning stage, they need much more support. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ said, amongst, amongst you, amongst the du'at, those are repellers. People, they, they feel like, oh, this religion is really, really tough. I'm not going to practice that. And I, I met those people until I studied the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. That was the changing of my life. The seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ had changed my life. When I see the Prophet ﷺ joking with his wife, racing with his, with his beloved wife Aisha, laughing until his molar teeth was shown in front of the people. So why this sheikh told me, don't show your teeth when you laugh? I was so angry, you know. <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Now why am I telling you this story? Because to, to maintain that change is a challenge, as I said. But the reward of resisting evil is great. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَاءِ تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ولا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياءكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم الله أكبر As of those who said our Lord is Allah How many of us here say our Lord is Allah? Raise up your hand If I see someone's hand down that means we are in trouble Okay, all of us are believers, alhamdulillah. But that is not enough, my brothers and sisters. To believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's it, it's not enough. What is more important is to remain upon that belief until the last day, until you breathe your last. Istiqamah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is motivating us in this ayah by telling us those who believe, those who say our Lord is Allah, then remain steadfast. What will happen to them, my brothers and sisters, at the most critical moment of their life, at the moment of death? The scariest moment of anyone's life is death, my brothers and sisters. Even the Prophet ﷺ described, he say, Inna lil mawti la sakarat. Indeed, death has got some agony. It's not easy. It's a musibah, a trial. At this very critical moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send his angels upon you, telling you what? You're scared of death? The angel will tell you, don't be scared. Allahu Akbar. And don't be sad. You are going to meet Allah. How could you be sad? Isn't this what you want to be in Jannah? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, don't be scared. And don't be sad. Receive the good news of Jannah which you were promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya. How many pages have we read in the Quran describing Jannah for those who are muttaqeen, for those who are righteous, for those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who know, who are aware that Allah is over watching us, who knows whether we are in public or in secret, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there watching us and giving a command to the angels to write down every single thing that we do. How could you sin? How could you do something haram when you know that Allah and his angels are watching you. So these are the criteria. Belief and istiqamah. The angels will comfort you at the moment of death. Don't be scared. Don't be sad. And receive the good news of Jannah, which you were promised. Not only that. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ These angels will tell you, we are your supporters in this world and in the next. And when you get to Jannah, when you get to Jannah, inshallah, you will have whatever you wish for and whatever you ask for. Allahu Akbar. Istiqamah is what we need. I believe that there will be no revival for this ummah without the manner of istiqamah. That's why every, every raka'ah, when we read Al-Fatiha, we say what? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide us, show us, take us to the straight path. Keep us upon the straight path. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. And we are repeating this every day, in every rakah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue by saying, and when you get to Jannah, you will have whatever you wish for, and whatever you ask for. Teach your children to imagine Jannah, to dream Jannah, instead of watching TV series and movies that are spoiling the brains of our children and making them addicted to imaginary stories that on the long run, it will actually inf infect their values and principles, the Islamic values and principles. I want to tell you another story, but please, please, please don't tell anyone. Okay, I used to love these Indian movies when I was young, Indian movies. Do you know Indian movies? Amitabh Bachchan? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So I used, you know, Indian movies are amazing. They teach you that if you jump off a mountain, it's okay. <laughs> 
Because a beautiful horse would be waiting down there for you. So I, <laughs> I used to love these Indian movies a lot. So one of these movies was, was called Mard, M-A-R-D. That's the name of the child. So the movie started like that. The British soldiers were attacking this village and the father is trying to protect his son. So he wanted to make a sign, you know, so that he don't lose his son or something. So he took a knife from his side. Now listen to this. Don't do this at home. He took a knife from his side and he started writing on the infant's chest with the knife. Yes, he did not take a ribbon, for example. He did not make a marker. No, 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 knife. <laughs> Sharp knife. And he started writing mud on the baby's chest. And the blood started to come out. SubhanAllah. Not only that, but he threw him in the river. And the river <laughs> washed him away. And far, far away on the, you know, by the riverside, there is a lady, a blind lady, who miraculously touched the baby and she took him out. And he became Amitabh Bachan. But guess what? Wait, wait, wait. The story is not over. After 30 years, the writing still there. But now it's a metal. It's metal, made of metal, called gold. Now, one day I woke up in the night. I, I watched this movie like 30 million times. I don't remember how many times. I went to the bathroom one, one night and I started to search in my father's stuff and I saw that blade, small blade. I took the blade. I looked in the mirror and I wrote, Mard. But I wrote it in Arabic because I didn't know Indian. <laughs> I took the pain. I saw the blood coming out. But the music was playing in my head. The Indian music was amazing. My mother was crying. My father was crying. The entire family halls were crying because of the music. It's not an entertaining session. It's a crying session. We have already problems of our own. Why are we bringing another movie to make us cry and sad? These movies twist your belief. It twists your identity. It makes you live in an imaginary world that you wish for the haram to happen rather than the halal. How many movies have we watched in the past where the hero, the, 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 the actor and the actress are in love, but the family members of the girl do not want her to marry that man? How many, how many movies have we watched about this story? So many stories. And what happened? The director will make you believe that the, this girl must marry the man against their parents' will, against her parents' will. So what will she do? She will enter the room of her dad while he's asleep and she will start searching for the car key because she want to escape. And whenever the father turn a little bit on the bed, what will happen? All the family members will make dua. Ya Rabbi, don't wake up. Ya Allah, please let the girl go away and make zina. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raja'un. So my father saw the blood the next morning and I was awake on the sound of music on my face, you know. <laughs> so my brothers and sisters, let your children dream Jannah. Let them imagine Jannah. Ask them what do you want to have in Jannah. But be careful, they will never have any interest in Jannah if they, if they see their parents are interested in dunya. If you're interested on these movies and you're asking them to open TV for you, Please, I want to watch, you know, it's 7.30 TV series, please open. You are asking your children to open these TVs and when they go on pornography later on, you can't solve the problem anymore. They became addicted to these things. My brothers and sisters, we are living in a time that if we don't look after our children carefully and supervise them about these electronic devices, we will lose them one day. Wallahi, we will lose them one day. So istiqama. Now I will, I will mention two practical tips inshallah. How can we maintain our steadfastness after making a positive change? Two points inshallah very important. Number one is dua. But not any dua. A dua that the Prophet sallallahu used to make to strengthen his heart upon the straight path. What is it? Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr. Oh Allah, I ask you continuity and steadfastness in my affair. Look, go on the internet, get this dua, print it out, teach it to your children and to your families and to your friends. Share it on Facebook and Twitter. This is how smart you can use this, these social media. It's not about going to check whether Sister Fatima has changed her profile picture or not. 
We waste time just looking at the album. 20 to 100 photos, just we go one by one. Like, like, like. <laughs> You're wasting your time. You could have read some, you know, surahs or some ayat from the Quran instead. Share these things. Allahumma inni as'aluka thabata fil amr. Oh Allah, I ask you continuity. Steadfastness upon this matter. Because the most beloved act in the sight of Allah is what? Continuous act of worship. Even if it is little. Even if it is small. That's what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Ahabbu al-a'mali ila Allah adwamaha wa inqal. The most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are continuous actions. Continuous deeds even if they are little. Even if they are little. And that's why again in another dua the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Allahumma ya muthabbit al-qulub. Thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah who changed the hearts. Who strengthened strength the heart. Make my heart firm upon your deen, upon your religion. Who is making this dua? The Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best of all choices. The selection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this dua. How about you and I? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks directly to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, telling him what? فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْ Be firm, be steadfast. As you have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa told his companions what? Shayyabatni Hud. The surah of Hud had, made, had turned my hair into gray because of the powerful message that it contained. The best of all people was commanded to be straightforward, to be steadfast. How about you and I? So this is the first tip if you wanted to remain upon the straight path. Do not give up on dua. This is the most powerful tool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us. It is the only tool that can change your destiny. If you want to make a change, dua is number one on the list. The Prophet sallallahu said, dua and qada ya'talijani ila yawm al qiyamah. They are actually fighting one another until the day of judgment. The qada of Allah is coming down to take place. And the dua of a person is going up, pushing back that qada. So if something was, well, apparently uh, bad was going to happen, your dua can make a change. So do not ever overlook the power of dua. And especially if you wanted to remain firm, steadfast, these two duas, you should memorize them. You should teach them to others. And secondly, good company. I related my story earlier to tell you that I was always with the wrong people in the wrong place all the time. So no one, called, no one came to me and told me, fear Allah, brother. Ittaqillah. No one came and told me, lower your gaze, akhi. No one. In fact, those people were telling me the opposite. Let us backbite. Let us, you know, look at bad women. Let us drink. Let us smoke. But as soon as I go to the masjid, later on after that uncle who scared me, <laughs> later on, all the brothers were surrounding me. And trying, very interested, to get me into da'wah. And that's another thing that can make your heart, you know, steadfast upon the true path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to engage in da'wah. When you see people are guided because of your effort, you will remain firm for a long time, inshaAllah. So the second one is good company. As I said earlier, the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu made it very, very clear. Al-mar'u ala deeni khalilih. A person will be inclined to follow the religion of his friend. So be careful of who are your friends. You have to be selective when it comes to friends. Like Brother Majid was describing earlier. When he kicked out his friend from the car. <laughs> who amongst you can do that after today? After this conference? When a sister come and say, you know, have you seen this sister? She's wearing a pink. <laughs> How many of us will stop that sister from backbiting? The other one. How many? From now on. How many sisters are going to block that conversation? Can you raise up your hand? How many are going to enjoy the juicy stuff? Raise up your hand. No one. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Brothers, I trust you. Don't fail me. So let us see some hands. How many of us from now on, inshallah, we will stop people from backbiting others in their absence? How many? Raise up your hand. If you don't do that, then you have wasted your money, Allah. You have wasted your time coming here. Because al-ilmu bila amalin junoon, wal-amalu bila ilmin la yakun. 
Knowledge without action is madness. And action without the proper knowledge doesn't exist. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to remain firm upon the Surat al-Mustaqeem, the straight path. It was an honor being with you.